you know, when you turn a unit, what do you have a checklist of items that you have to do in order to get the ready, the unit ready? And what are those? So the unit turn checklist is to keep the cost as low as low as possible. But Matt is a professional property manager. He just bought his first quadplex uh, recently too. So he's having a lot of success with that. He is an awesome guy, a huge resource, knows what he's doing, and is going to kind of talk to us today about the ins and the outs of property management. Um, So Matt, I'll kind of pass it off to you if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing. And uh, yeah. Absolutely, man. Actually, I'm going to share my screen real quick. All right. I think, is it retired by 40 or retired by 40 and die? Retired by 40 or die. Oh, uh, see, I had it on there and then the Zoom link was very modest. So I got rid of it. So, but, uh, <laughs> but first of all, Will, thanks for having me on here. I'm super pumped to be able to come on and talk a little bit about property management specifically. Um, I got a few other companies and a podcast and stuff that's on here. I got a shameless plug at the end and I'll kind of go over everything. Uh, I've been in real estate since 2017. Uh, like Will said, I met them in the real estate lab group and uh, property management specifically I've been doing for actually April, I think 16th will be one full year in management. I was a licensed agent for four years before that. Um, I'm still licensed and still, I'm actually, we can dig into that at the end in the shameless plug, but I'm still licensed. I utilize it on a daily basis. I post a lot of the properties we have for lease on the MLS, which is just one other area we can put properties. We'll dig into it, but uh, yeah, my name is Matt Barnett. I'm uh, 25. I uh, started five years ago, um, but let's uh, property management. So I know before you guys hopped on, Will and I were kind of talking about where you guys are at. We got some that have properties, some that are new to acquiring properties, some that don't have properties, some guys that might have a little bit of experience, whatever it may be. Uh, I put together this year presentation. There's literally no rhyme or reason or order that any of this is in. There's no step-by-step or anything like that because You can buy a property completely vacant and need work. You can buy a property with a perfect tenant. You can buy a property with a crap tenant. You can buy a property with a negative lease ledger, which we can get into. Um, But I think one of the things moving forward for a lot of the new guys too, or even experienced before you buy a property, besides the tenants, the rent, the underwriting, everything you do in the deal to make sure the deal makes sense, you got to make sure the building's going to still be standing once you buy it, right? There's going to be, you have your CapEx expenditures and maintenance but you got to do an inspection on this property, no matter what kind of inspection. And we'll go over them here in a second um, when you first buy it. And it's very, it's kind of a key aspect because you can have a tenant at 1200 a month. You could, could have paid 150 for that property. And if you're spending 1500 a month in repairs because you bought, no offense, the crap property without doing a proper inspection, it's going to kill your cash flow. It's going to kill your equity. It's going to completely kill the deal. And it's not going to make any sense. Um, so there's a couple of different kinds of inspections I think are very important. And actually that picture is from the four unit that I bought. I hate basements and it's a Michigan basement. I didn't want to go down there. And the inspector was like, you should probably come down and look at this. I'm like, why? It's like, it's pretty bad. So, uh, I will be fixing this soon, uh, for reference for anyone that doesn't see an issue with this, you should not have four by fours holding up your house. Uh, it's not recommended. And actually, this was an add-on. That's why there's a hole in the brick. But that is what you don't want to see. And I would never have known that because I hate basements and didn't want to go in one. So that brings me to number one, uh, private inspection. So a private inspection on a property. When you purchase a property, this isn't the appraisal. This isn't the city inspection. All these other inspections that come with the property. This is your private inspection. You hire a (coughs) third-party company. I use trademark home inspections. I've used them forever. So even as an agent that I carried into when I started buying properties, I love them to death. Um, this one was like, I don't know, 700 bucks for four units. So single family home runs usually like 375, 400. So I all day long would spend the money on $700 to determine if I'm going to completely kill the deal or not. I have no problem losing $700 instead of losing $700 a month. Uh, so private inspections are very, very important. And we're going to dig more into these when we get into a few more slides, because there's some things that, you know, correlate with one another. Um, so that's a private inspection. You buy the property, you do your own inspection, you do your own due diligence. They give you a complete inspection report and you can do whatever you want to do with that report. Uh, they're not telling you, you have to do anything. They're telling you what's wrong with the house and make recommendations based off of the information they gave you. Um, a lot of people know about those ones. The second one though, is when you sell a property, every city is different. Some cities require a certificate of occupancy when you purchase it and sell it. Some they can carry over. 
But city inspection is a little different because these the city is not recommending you make these repairs. They're requiring you make these repairs and make it livable or at least make sure the structure is standing and there's not like chipping lead-based paint, for example. They tend to flag stuff like that. They want GFCI, six foot from the sink, all the same old, same old. They no longer want flex pipe for the dryers. They want solid pipes with no screws in it. Um, it becomes a habit because I've done so many of them. But the city inspection is a required inspection by the city and the repairs must be made. They usually give you a time frame. You have to do them and get them done. The perk to knowing this is if you have a real estate agent, they can ask. Sometimes you can do an as is sale. So this inspection's already been done. You can review a copy of the report and say, I'm willing to take these on and I will buy this property as is. Or you look at it and you're like, I'm not rebuilding half of this house because that's what the city wants. Um, so that's, that's the city inspection, um, which is, I kind of covered the as is repair assumption a little bit in there. Um, rental inspection though, is different. Some cities after you complete a C of O or a city inspection, they're going to say, great, the building looks great, but is it livable? Now they're going to want to do a rental inspection. It's kind of tedious because now it's the safety and hazard stuff. Are there handrails? Three more steps. Is there a handrail? Is there smoke detectors in every room? Is there a carbon monoxide detector on the outside of each room, et cetera? Those are kind of the safety things. Now that the building's great, can people live there? That's a rental inspection. Uh, Section eight is actually very similar. Um, those inspections you almost will never have to do unless you actually place a section eight inspection. They do a section eight inspection they inspect it and they also make you are required to do repairs before they can place a section eight tenant. Sometimes there's ways around that the tenant could be existing and they've been there for two years. You want to increase rent. They're going to be like, great. I want to do an inspection and make sure that they can still live there. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Section eight inspections are also required though. Cause if you don't complete them in a certain time frame, they're not going to pay you. And uh, you know, we all want to get paid. Um, property management inspection. This one is, not, you don't have to do this. Sometimes we have guys that may not have the experience. Um, the Troy, for example, doesn't Troy, the city in Michigan, doesn't have rental inspections. You don't need to register properties as rentals. You don't have to do anything. But the problem with that is some landlords will go in and they reach out to us because they're like, well, what repairs would you make to make it livable? What do we have to do to get this leased out the fastest? So the property management inspection, we come in and do an inspection and make recommendations, not required repairs. And we recommend this is what needs to happen. So. All of this matters because it could make or break your deal because you can have the most insane private inspection. The city could slam you, um, which is hard because some stuff you can get away with, some stuff you can't really argue it. The, the best way to work with cities is just do what they ask. I hate saying that, but it just works out in the long run if you just do what they want you to do. But if you have an upfront knowledge or upfront knowing of what it is they want you to repair, you could probably back out of the deal. Um, the hard part is sometimes you have to purchase the property and then they want to inspect it. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but obviously use your knowledge and your abilities of your private inspection because the majority of the time, what they flag on the private inspection is what they're going to flag on the city inspection. Um, and before I go into the next slide, if you guys at any point have any questions, you do not have to wait to the end. If I'm just rambling on about inspections, you're more than welcome to, if there's any certain topic, anything, just chip in, cut me off like, yo, Matt, if you got a question, let's dig in on it. I'm totally fine with that. You don't need to wait for anything. Um, Real so, quick, inspection wise. Yeah. So obviously, city inspection mm -hmm. um, is through whatever city. A Section 8 through whatever Section 8 um, program is paying. Correct. So there's one, like there's Mishta, and then there's a certain, there's a different Section 8 one. So there is different, so yes, there's different ones and they have different inspections, but it's all going to be the same thing. It's going to be similar to the rental. They're going to want to make sure it's in living condition and everything. All the they're very they want to make sure if you provide the appliances, all the appliances work, everything like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. So you inspected your property. And again, these are no. I guess I did kind of put them in some type of order, but you can buy a property in any any one of these slides. Um, you inspect the property, and figured out you like it, you want to buy it, and there's maybe there's current tenants there, and you decide the rent roll makes sense based on the repairs you have to do or not do. Maybe you bought a turnkey property. Or maybe it's vacant, you got to do work. Either way, uh, you're going to want to, at some point, someone, a tenant's going to move out or if it's vacant, you did the repairs. At some point, you are listing this thing for rent. You want to get a butt in there and get paid every single month, get your security deposit, do what you got to do. But you got to, you can't, 
I hate, I, I say this because I'm a real estate agent and I see for sale by owners and they're in their mirror with their phone, just like taking pictures and stuff. It, don't do that. <laughs> um, so the, the number one thing with your listing is you do want to make it professional. Now with leasing, I actually do not hire professional photographers for our, our rentals. I do it on our listings because I can go in, we have a 3D camera and everything that we use. And I can, in fact, use my phone on a wide angle lens, get a picture of the entire room, watermark the photo. Um, and then post it online. Uh, but when it comes to listings, you got to figure out where you're going to list it, right? And you have to follow up with it on a <laughs> daily basis. Um, with um, how we do it, so we use Buildium, which is a software, which most of you don't have. If you're going to be private landlords, you're going to post directly on Zillow, directly on Craigslist, directly on Facebook Marketplace. And you have to log into each one of those every day, respond to the messages, you know, get supply them with your application link, your application, whatever it is you're going to use for an application, supply them with that, respond to their messages. Uh, we set up open houses on a weekly basis for all of our listings. So if you're going to do that, make sure you do that. But you got to have the listing, make sure the description is very accurate and then fluff it up a little bit. It's, it's a property to you, but it's a home to them. So you got to make it feel like a home to them and make them want to live there and stay there as long as possible. I mean, obviously we try and do one year leases, all of our residential leases, we do two years. So I want to make sure they love this place for the next two years. And if some, and, and on, and on and on, right? Like two years, I want to do a lease renewal. I you love, they still love living there. I don't have to lease it again and they just stay there. So I fluff it up from the start, make the photos look great and everything. Um, so you got to figure out where you're going to list it. Um, the biggest thing also is price. <laughs> uh, this market's a little interesting. So it's kind of hard to talk, talk on price because you can kind of list almost at not anything you want, but there I'm seeing thousand, eleven, twelve hundred dollar houses going for like 13, 14 right now in our area in South and, you know, Metro Detroit, obviously I'm closer to like Ipsy Ann Arbor and stuff. So they are kind of higher markets, but these are like 900 square foot ranch or bungalow style homes going for like 15, 1600 a month, which absolutely blows my mind, but moving into it or even a deal that you, you, you've already underwrote it. So you already know what price you want. So you need to have a set Matt, price. Can I cut you off for a sec? Yeah, absolutely. So quick question. So for people that aren't, you know, you have building them. Um, mm -hmm. well, obviously, it sounds like you're able to kind of find units and put them up for rent on multiple places directly through Buildium, which is easy for you, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I, let's say I'm a private landlord. I have two units, you know, one just came open. I don't want to log into 10 different websites. Where do you find the best tenants and have the most success? If you had to pick two websites that you would list the units on. Zillow and Facebook Marketplace all day long. People are on Facebook Marketplace all day. They're, I tend to have good luck with that around 12 to 2, actually, because people are on lunch. They're already on Facebook. So now they're already on Facebook looking at Dodge Chargers and places for rent anyways. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Facebook Marketplace is actually really awesome. And it's a lot more personalized. And I like it as a landlord because you can creep on people. You can't do that on Zillow. You go to their Facebook profile. You see if they're just talking smack or if they're just like they're actually interested or not. Obviously, you can't profile people at equal housing opportunity, but you can definitely, it's kind of nice to check people out before. Uh, don't recommend it. But um, Zillow, Zillow's hot because it's also the number one platform, all listings, everything. Even when we list a property in the MLS, it gets auto-populated onto Zillow anyways, because Zillow takes it right from the MLS, which is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, Zillow and Facebook Marketplace are our two biggest hits. I would say we lease out 70% of our properties from Zillow or Facebook Marketplace. Okay. And then, so, right. So I put my property up on Facebook Marketplace. I've identified the price because I underwrote it already. Now, you know, I, so I've had experience with Facebook Marketplace. When you put a property up around Facebook Marketplace, you get about 30 messages in the first day. And a lot oh. of them are, is this available? Is this available? You know, because <laughs> that's the standard button people can click on Facebook Marketplace. Mm -hmm. How... You know, so let's say I put it up on Facebook Marketplace. How do you go about making sure people fill out the application? I'm not just responding to, is this available all day? You know, what's kind of a way to yeah. kind of make that more efficient? So that's also, it's a big reason we do the open house because it's hard to respond to someone who's like, here's the application link if you're interested. So I like to be able to provide some kind of value and be like, hey, like come to the open house, come see it. I would love to meet you in person. Here's the application link if you're interested. We have had a lot of people look at it. So first come, first serve, but I would love to see you. So the, the value is providing them with an open house and we also provide a 3D tour. So maybe they're like, I'm stuck at work. I can't see the house. Well, here's the 3D tour link. We use Matterport, uh, for example, and they can literally walk through the house on their phone or their computer and check it out. 
you know, the, the pushback on that is you don't get a sense of just like, you know, how far the walls or ceiling are, whatever you get a sense of the layout of the house, at least, which is huge. I have people submit applications just off of that. Um, but yeah, I it's just got to try and provide some value because it does get a little tedious. Is it still available? Still available? Still available? Yes, it's still listed. So it is still available. <laughs> like it's not gone. So yes, it's still available. But I try and provide value. Come to the open house. Here's the link. Here's a 3D tour. You know, any any questions? I provide upfront questions, 600 minimum credit score, three times the rent and gross income. We do a background pass eviction check because those are going to be the next questions they ask or what are your requirements? So just kind of throw it all at them at once and kind of get it out of the way. And you can kind of filter people out pretty quickly because the ones that respond are usually a little more interested and they do tend to show up to the open house. And I would say, I'm not sure what the response rate is, but it is pretty common for them just to click the automated button, which is a little tedious, but still getting responses. I still provide everyone with the same message and value. Okay, and then one final question, just to follow that up. Um, a, because you know a lot of our members have you know their first property and they're gonna be renting it out soon or they've gone through a rental before. Um, and it can be a little tedious finding and collecting info on people. Do you have a free application? Like, is there anywhere you would recommend something that, you know, I have a duplex, I need to collect applications. Is there a certain website I should use for those applications? Um, as a property manager, I've never done it privately. So we use Buildium. It's all through our software. The app is all through there and everything. They fill everything out. When they click the application link, it takes them to the property and Buildium fills out. We do the credit check application fee and everything through, through Buildium. So I can't really help on that one when it comes to private side. Okay. No worries. That's what I figured out. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah, no, I'll, and, I'll let you keep going here. No, that's, I like it. Cause that it's a little more personal. I like when we can, everyone can ask questions and kind of dig into things a little better than me just random rambling through a checklist. Yeah. What, um, what other questions do you guys have so far? Does anybody have any? <laughs> no, I think no, that's I fine. We're going to get into the, the fun stuff anyways. I think the beginning, like everyone, I mean, not everyone knows about inspections, but it's not the fun stuff. We want to talk about collecting rent. Um, so leasing, yeah, obviously. So I was kind of talking about making the photos all nice. We do a 3D tour. And actually, Will covered this pretty dang good when he's asking about the Facebook stuff on lead follow-up. Uh, in regards to that, I try to respond within minimum a one to 12 hour window. After that, they've probably already looked at seven other properties and completely forgot about yours. Um, if they submit an application, I actually have a little trick that I use uh, to keep people on our property and not anyone else's. Um, they're not approved through us because obviously we still have to collect a lot of information and verify income, but I tell them they're pre-qualified with us and we'd love to move forward. You've been pre-qualified moving forward. I just need to verify income. I need your last three months of pay. But in their mind, it's like, I'm pre-qualified. I'm good to go. They don't even look at anything else. Now they're just waiting to hear back from you. And then they're just sitting there waiting for you. And that's it. So there's a few, so those are kind of like, I don't know. I guess that's a little secret that I use. Just pre-qualify them. They love it. We'll stay with you. But the lead follow-up is very important. I would say after 12 hours, you probably lost that person already. There is not much inventory and there's a lot of people looking for places to lease right now. So they're Phil, they're probably clicking, is this still available on 20 things while they're on lunch? And they don't even know who you are or what your property is. Um, app fee, this is important. So ours is $50 because immediately after that, we turn around and spend 20 or actually $18 on our background and past eviction check. This is also through Buildium. And unfortunately we don't, it's not a third party software. So I could not provide you with that as well. That's the kind of the, the part of property management. We keep everything in one. Um, so unfortunately I can't give you a direction on where to go do your own background evictions. Will, do you have anywhere that you use for that? Uh, I've used Zillow before. Zillow has like a free online application and then you can run a background check. I think it's like 25 bucks. You can do background and credit check. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's good to know. I didn't know that because ours is all part of the system, but uh, your app fee has, you don't want a $10 app fee and then turn around and spend $25 to figure this information out. Uh, we also have a processing fee and there's a few other things. So that $50 covers all that. We almost, we might make $10 per app fee, but other than that, we're not actually getting $50. That actually just covers expenses to run this application and everything, um, which income verification is part of that. That one's actually my job. Uh, once they provide where they work and everything, before I even ask for pay stubs, I'm calling their work, their workplace. And I'm like, hello, does Joe Blow still work at ABC Warehouse? What, that is an actual place. So it's a horrible example. Um, do they still work there? Are they? Would you consider them a reputable employee? 
have they ever done anything unlawful in the workplace? Do they, the, how long have they worked there? If they put their dates on the application, I've worked there since 2017. Have they actually worked it from 2017? More importantly, do they still work there? Yes. Great. They like, that's it. Cool job income verification. Good to go. Um, actually I confused those two job is what I just went over. Income is last three months of pay stubs. Um, it varies. If you have people like me three years ago where I didn't have a W-2 or pay stubs, I was strictly commissioned as a real estate agent. I need last year's 1099. Some landlords want two years, last two years of 1099s, which is, I mean, that's nothing wrong with that, but we only look for a year of 1099. Um, we also allow if someone has, has a sign on, like they signed on to, actually, I just had a professional golfer I moved in but it was salary because he is also coaching at a golf course or something. But it showed me I make $110,000 a year and guaranteed he signed the company sign. Here's what he gets per hour. And this is what it is per week. That showed me everything that I needed to know. Is it a risk? Yeah. Cause you're assuming that he's going to continue to work there and not get fired, but it doesn't really change anything. Even if you ask someone for the last three months of pay stubs, doesn't mean they're going to be working there two months after they move in. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, scam proof. This one's huge. Um, your listings. Watermark your photos if you if you can, if any way if any way possible. We put this little propel link that's at the bottom left here is in the bottom right of all of our photos. We scan proof everything as much as possible. We actually just had a scenario where and we see this a lot closer to Detroit in our Allen Park Redford properties and stuff like that. We'll post a listing on Zillow for fifteen hundred a month, and then there'll be one on Craigslist for eight hundred. And that they're just like, I don't know how it works. They somehow scam people out of money. And then they show up to the open house. Like I'm ready to move in. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't even know you. Well, I gave you, I gave you money. I'm like, no, you didn't. You gave someone else money. It's a horrible conversation. I hate being in that position and they hate being in that position. Uh, and we actually had one in Allen park where we sent the maintenance tech out and he's like, Hey, there's stuff in the garage. I'm like, man, in my mind, it's another squatter. I uh, show up. I go in the house and it's not only trash all over, there's full on beds, furniture, couches, all the cookware. And it's been like 48 hours since I've been in this house. This person moved all the way in. It was not supposed to be there. The scammer said, hey, I lost the keys. You just need to hire a locksmith and the house is yours. That's kind of a red flag to me. But most, I mean, common sense is not so common. And unfortunately, I had to tell her she needs all her stuff out by 5 p.m. And she will not make, get her money back. I don't. No, who scammed her? It was some fake pastures like name that they use on a lease agreement that I got a hold of. Um, it's sad. It's not for those people, but bulletproofing your listings book can prevent that. You don't want that in your property. It's an added expense. We had to go through, change all the locks, clean everything out. And it was a pain. Um, does it happen often? Absolutely not. That'll probably never happen to any of you guys. So it's not to scare you, but it's just a reminder to actually take it seriously and try and scam proof your listings. It's actually pretty important. Uh, we have meetings about this on a weekly basis, actually. Um, that's, that's, I'm coming up. Is there any questions in leasing at all? Like anything that I miss anything? Is there anything, any questions, anything? Before I get into the fun stuff. Yeah, Matt. So, um, I have, you know, wh where would you recommend somebody go find a lease agreement? I know that's a super simple document. Um, once you get one, it's very easy, but you know, I've, if you don't have one, you might not know where to get one. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, absolutely. Spend the money and actually get one from an attorney and not LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer or something. The better you can protect yourself, the better off you'll be. Uh, I hate saying that because I didn't have to do that at a property management company. It was already provided. Uh, but I do have a lot of guys that have moved tenants in. They used a free lease agreement online or something. And then that's why they ended up hiring us because they're having difficulties with going back and forth with issues with the tenant. Who's in the right? Who's in the wrong? Lease agreement doesn't state anything. I need you guys to manage it because I'm tired of this. So I love being able to provide people and say, hey, spend, I don't know what it would be nowadays, probably like $1,200, $1,500 for an actual decent lease agreement. Ours is 26 pages. It literally protects both sides. I'm here. To, I'm not here to protect just my side as a property manager. I'm here to protect the tenant as well. And you want to make sure that includes everything. So don't cheap out on a lease agreement because that is what's protecting your entire deal to begin with. So go to the attorney, do it right, uh, and have one made. Go to the so state. So you're gonna you're gonna send us your lease agreement, right? I wish I could. <laughs> I didn't have it made. I'd probably get fired. <laughs> the valiant effort. <laughs> Actually, I guess I do a blank version, I believe. Don't mark my words on that. I'll ask him because I might be able to actually provide something. Um, 
All right, repairs and maintenance. Goodness, this comes down to how well you did on your inspection and how well you renovated and how well you bulletproof tenant proof the property, which we'll get more into. Um, just as a, for fun, this was an actual voicemail that I got. Uh, you're more than welcome to read it. Basically, uh, he said, Matt, this is, I'm just going to call him Steve uh, from apartment one. Uh, our toilet, it says it's not from flushing too much toilet paper or something or a paper towel, uh, whatever down the toilet. It's actually from the poop that was just too big for the toilet. <laughs> um, I've, I literally was shocked when I got this call. I never thought I would ever see something like this. I always heard the stories and this is one of my first ever maintenance requests I ever got. And I thought it was hilarious. So I kept it. I told him I kept it out as long as I can crap his name out. He was fine with that because we laugh about it now when he calls me, but it was hilarious. He was actually at the store when he called me. So I called him back and I asked where he's at. He said, I'm at the store. I said, great, buy a plunger or else I'm charging you to come out there and plunge a toilet for something that you did. So I did not get charged for that. I told him you need to fix that um, because that's gross. <laughs> um, but it, this is where this comes in handy though. Repairs and maintenance. This is you also in the lease agreement defers who is responsible for what. No, my lease agreement doesn't state if it poops too big that the tenant is responsible. That's just common sense. But uh, inspection repairs. Um, so we kind of went over that a little bit. Um, those are try. Actually, I'm going to skip down actually because I kind of want to stay on topic for a second. So I'm going to skip down to maintenance. Um, who's doing the maintenance? Are you doing the maintenance? Did you hire a handyman, a third-party contractor? Who do you have that's liable enough that if there's a leak and it's an emergency and you don't know how to do it, that you can call and he'll be out there on the hour to get it done? Who do you, who are your contacts? Who do you have set up to have this stuff on hand and available and ready? Because I know if at least a duplex, if the guy on top starts leaking, um, as concerning as it is, I'm more concerned about the guy below whose ceiling's probably going to fall on him in the next you know, three hours from the water. So who's going to be out there doing those things? Is it you? That's fine. Keep your expenses down low, get out there, get your hands dirty and get it done. Um, but who's responsible for certain things? So this is a double-edged sword because the lease agreements do state some things. So in ours, if it's a common sense item, and I hate saying it that way, but now that I know how tenants are, I call it common sense. Um, if a light bulb goes out and they call me, I'm going to tell them to change it. You, you screw it lefty loose. It was, I can't even, I'm now I'm looking like a tenant uh, righty tighty lefty Lucy. Um, so who's responsible for that? You can change a light bulb. Everybody can change a light bulb. If you spoke detector starts chirping, it's a nine volt battery. I can show you where your closest Walgreens is and you can put a battery in there. You are responsible for that. Now here's where it gets interesting. They gave you a call. My sink backed up. Okay. Well, we'll send someone out because your sink backed up. I don't know the reason behind it. Uh, well, we get out there and sure enough, it, it's a root or something. Great. Landlord's responsible for that. The tenant did not call that. Now the call, my sink backed up. We get there and pull out five hair ties and a piece of gum. The tenant is responsible for that. The tenant calls that sink the backup. It's, and it's, it's a hard argument, but you have to stay true to it. Um, and for that reason, our lease agreement actually states that um, every repair that is their responsibility, they're getting charged hundred dollars because our guys are $60 an hour, uh, which filters out the nonsense calls because they know if they're able to do something, if they cause the issue, they can fix it or else they're getting charged hundred dollars. Um, so it's very important to make sure both sides know who's responsible for what. And I make sure I have that conversation when I move a tenant in. I say, hey, and this is like page seven, line item number 23 or whatever it is, just for example, if the light bulb goes out, change it. Smoke detector stops working, change the battery. Sink clogs up because you drop stuff down it, that's on you. Call your own plumber. Um, if it's leaking or backing up to the point where it's overflowing onto the sink, onto the floor, well, call me and you'll still get charged for it. But we need to de de decide who's responsible for what and make sure that they can take responsibility for their own actions and not just use you to fix things. Tenants are very good. If they want something fixed, they're going to break it so that they can get a new one. That's not fair to you. That's not fair to your cash flow. It's not fair to your income statement that they're being stupid. So make sure they're responsible for those things. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with who's liable and what does the lease say. I kind of covered all that. Um, so I'm going to jump back up. I should have put these repair section in with the inspection one, but the inspection repairs unit turns and capital items. Again, who's doing it? Right. So if you're going to turn a unit, if you have a unit turn after someone moves out or you have inspection repairs required by the city, 
or capital items, like you have to replace appliances, you can probably do that. Call Home Depot, they'll deliver it. I use American Freight. Um, but who's doing it? Is it a contractor? Is it third party? If you have a unit turn, it's, it's going to turn into a reno and you got to replace the carpet, paint all the walls, replace all the light fixtures, replace all the appliances. Is it more of a cost effective thing for you to spend a little more and have someone else do it and finish in a week? Or are you going to DIY it and take a little more time and kind of kills your cash flow because you lose whatever your rent is, you're losing per day while you're in there. So the goal is to do turns as quick as possible, but you need to figure out who's going to do that and put a system in place. Even if it's you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I know a lot of owners that I'm friends with a lot of owners that I have a guy that manages 80 units by himself. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because he has systems in place. He does not, something happens that pops up out of the ordinary and out of nowhere and he doesn't know what to do. He has a system in place for it. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm actually kind of jealous of it because it's pretty cool. Um, or Matt, I got a question me. for, for unit turns. What, you know, when you turn a unit, what do you have a checklist of items that you have to do in order to get the ready, the unit ready? And what are those? So the unit turn checklist is to keep the cost as low as, as low as possible. Um, so what that is, is when someone moves out a tenant again, whose responsibility is it? So in the lease is there's a security deposit section. Um, and we actually use, I might be able to show you guys actually, this determines the unit turn. Because if it's stuff that a tenant is going to get charged for after they moved out, it's going to cover those repairs anyways, and you're still going to do it, but not out of your pocket now. Um, so I use this app. It's called Happy Inspector. I don't know if you guys can even see this, if it'll focus or not. It has all of our properties on it. Oh, all like all like 200 something. So for example, so we do do an inspection, yes, but... You go through, this is when a tenant moved in. Hopefully it shows up. It has every single room, every single item in that room in a checklist. And then below all that, every single item is every single picture of every single thing in those rooms down to the baseboards, the plugs, outlet, whatever you want. This full inspection. That's when a tenant moves in. Cause now I know what it looks like when they moved in. I have a picture of all the barcodes of all the appliances. So they can order them without ever having to go see them. That's when they move in. So when they move out and we need to determine what we have to do for a unit turn, I'm going to do the same inspection. It's going to be a move out inspection. And I'm going to compare the two. If I know that this outlet was not broken when I did the move in inspection, I'm adding it to their, their statement and it's coming out of their security deposit. Oh, excuse me. Um, and same that they beat the walls up, there's holes in the walls, et cetera. The things you can are noticeable, you can charge a tenant for. But if I do a move in inspection before they move in, before they move out, I'm going to compare the two and they're going to get charged for it. Unfortunately, we still have to do the work, but it's not coming out of your pocket. It's coming out of their security deposit. We also have that conversation before they move in. When it comes to a checklist for unit turn, the number one goal is to keep that turn as low as possible. If you just had a tenant in there for a year and you just made, I don't know, net 17 grand, and then you have to turn around and spend eight on a, like a renovation, that completely defeats the purpose of having a rental because now it's like you put someone in there, you got rent, now you got to spend it to do it all over again. Not what we want. We want to keep our turns under $2,000. Uh, so we expect our tenants to take care of the properties. Uh, this inspection helps because you're going to send them a statement, probably without a security deposit in the mail. They're going to call you freaking out why. You're going to send them both the inspections. You already sent them their ledger, which explains what charges got removed. Um, and we kind of go off of that. We kind of do allow, make sure our tenants take care of the property. But when it comes to renovations, I guess, um, where it's a little different. So if you just bought a property and there's no tenant in there, we're going to do a renovation. We put a bid together. You just have to agree on the price and we do the work. Uh, but turns itself is not necessarily a checklist. Obviously, every outlet has to work. All the appliances have to work. Everything, light fixtures, everything has to work. Um, Obviously, all those things have to get done. So every light feature is broken, they're getting replaced. Um, but the goal is to keep turns super low. <laughs> I got a little too in depth on that, but we don't want to kill the cash flow on a turn every year or two years. No, that makes sense. Does anybody have any questions so far about the repairs and maintenance? I like this group. <laughs> I guess you're hitting the nail on the head. Um, yeah, I guess <laughs> let's, let's keep going. That or they're sleeping. I don't know. <laughs> Um, um, I know Drake. Yes, you're you're sure. just so clear, man. This is this is a great presentation. Oh, I'll take it. 
I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, we'll keep moving though. We'll keep moving. But like I said, you got any questions, honestly, you just kept me off. I'm here to talk, help answer any questions, whatever. Two guys. Um, yeah. This, you know, it's a presentation, but at the same time, it can be a conversation too. Um, so, yeah. you know, chime in when you guys have questions, if you think of something, just cut them off. Cause Matt will not give you any seconds. You got to just cut them off. <laughs> That's not, no fun. No, I'm not saying that in a negative way, but I'm just no, saying like, just, just cut them off and ask the question and let's make it a conversation. So um, let us know if you guys have any questions. Awesome, man. All right. Now the fun part is rent collection. So after we do all these repairs and place the tenant, we want to get our freaking money, man. We want to get paid. We want to make that income statement look good, which we're going to dig into. Um, I'm going to cover, I am going to keep this one short and sweet and to the point because this topic alone I could probably put a presentation of its own together because it can get pretty in-depth with rent collection and accounting and everything. So I'm just going to do the basics. Um, rent collection, how are you collecting rent? You put someone in there, how are they paying you now? Hopefully you're not going there every month and they're giving you cash. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, so as a management company, we do have a software slash portal that we use called Buildium where a tenant can go in and pay by EFT, credit card, or pay near me. You can also use these options without a software. Venmo, Cash App, and Pay Near Me exists outside of the portal. If you just Google Pay Near Me, I am gonna fluff this up like crazy. Pay Near Me allows our cash paying tenants to never bother you. Um, it is a QR code system. Uh, CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart now allows it. It's Pay Near Me is an app. They download it, you can give them a pay code. It's a QR code that shows up on your phone. They take their cash that you don't want, but you want your money, you want it to show up on, you don't want to, you know, um, you don't want to do under the table. So cash, they can take it to Walmart, Walgreens, or, or 7-Eleven. They hand the clerk the cash and their QR code. Kirk, the clerk takes the cash and $2 fee, scan the code. When they scan the code, that money goes into that location, and then it gets sent right to us electronically immediately. So we get the funds immediately. They were able to give them cash. I don't want the cash. I just want the funds. So they can send it to you electronically, which is probably the best thing ever invented. I love it to death. It's great for older tenants that don't have emails, EFT, all these things. You would believe it or believe it or not, actually three of my four tenants don't have EFT or credit card to bank accounts, which is great. I found that out afterwards. So I had to go explain to 80 year olds how a QR code works and how they can take cash and do this. I love it. I recommend it. Um, I think everyone should have that tool in their belt because it's very, I love it. You can leverage the hell out of it. <laughs> um, credit card cause of charge a percent or is it just that flat $2 fee? It's $2.99. I just okay. rounded, but yeah, it's $2.99. Uh, I haven't seen it vary with the rent amount or anything. I've always seen $2.99. If they ever increase or decrease it, I mean, I wouldn't know. But I can tell you that uh, it's cheaper than credit card. Our credit card fee, even in the apartment I live in, is $50. Ours is also about that. And EFT is 2% of the amount that you're sending. Uh, EFT is, if you connect a bank account, is even cheaper, which is nice. Um, that one's nice because then EFT gives them the option to direct, take it directly out of their bank account. Or some tenants don't even want to think about rent, so they will do an automatic payment. I freaking love that. Landlords love automatic payments until you get a reverse notice, it bounced, there wasn't enough in their account. So it bounced and you didn't get the money. So now you have to call them and tell them they need to pay rent, uh, which is not, usually not an issue. They probably just forgot to transfer money from their savings to checkings and forgot it was automatic. That's not an issue, but these are all options you can use. Venmo, Cash App, you name it. Uh, even though Venmo, I think now, if it's over 600 a year or something, you're gonna get taxed or something like that. I didn't read into it. Um, but there's a million ways to collect your rent and you do not need to collect cash anymore. Um, it's including personal checks. We don't even take personal checks anymore. Uh, there's like out of our 300 properties, we have like two old people that send us checks. Other than that, it's 2022. You should probably figure it out. Like we, we don't take personal checks. Now, if from a private landlord perspective, I think there's nothing wrong with that. It's just an accounting issue on our end. That's, it's not easy. Um, I would say as a private landlord, you could probably do it. Do you collect do you collect checks, Will? No, I all my tenants pay online. Okay, see, well, the I, options there. I just a, don't do it. As a smaller landlord, um, I would do, I would recommend Venmo or Cash App. 
Um, until you get to about 20 units, you can do Venmo and Cash App and it won't get that confusing or that big of a nightmare. I would just set up a small, simple spreadsheet and make sure you track who paid. Um, there's invoices in Excel that you can just copy and paste. Super easy to use. Um, but that's Zillow that's what I and recommend. Zillow and like apartments.com even let you manage payments through there and it's free. Oh, that's awesome. landlords also. So I'm testing out apartments.com with my, I think this should be my first month with it, but uh, the one tenant's taking forever to sign up for it. So he's actually late on rent now because he hasn't finished signing up, but. That's good to know. Thanks for sharing that, Spencer. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. So yeah, I guess at the end of the day, really nobody's using cash or checks anymore. Personal checks, the only issue is they can kind of, I don't know how to, I don't even use checks because I'm so young. I guess you can cancel them or something. Is that right? Like, because technically a personal check is a form of cash. It's almost like a debit card and you can actually void it or cash it, or they can call three days later and say that check doesn't exist. And then everything bounces and it's an issue. Uh, credit card and EFT, they're going to have to call their bank and completely explain to them why paying rent is fraud, which is not going to go over very well. Um, speaking, so I love that we started talking about keeping track of everything because the accounting session, uh, there's going to be two very important things as a landlord. You're going to want two separate and for private landlords, I guess you can have an Excel sheet with a lease ledger, which is going to show their rents, pet fee, security deposit charges. Security deposit should probably be the first thing on that line item when you collect it, when they move in, uh, you show the charge and then them paying it and it should be to zero rent. Same thing. Uh, I forgot to add on their prorated rent because obviously if they move in in the middle of the March, um, they're not going to pay the full month. Um, we do collect on moving though, a full first month's rent, security deposit, hundred dollar admin fee. And then the following month is prorated, but we require a full month's rent in order to move in. Um, but there's nothing wrong with that. But you want a lease ledger. You want to keep track of every single rent payment you have. The date is very important of when they were charged the rent and when they paid it is very important, especially when you get into the fun stuff, which let me click here. The legal, which we're going to get into. Um, you want records of all this because you're going to want to provide a lease ledger. Uh, pet fees. This also has to be part of the ledger because they are getting charged it. We do a $250 non-refundable deposit up front per pet and $25 a month per pet. And it is separate from rent. So it's not rent is $900. And then you put it on there as rent is 925. Rent is $900. And there's going to be a separate charge for $25. That is pet fee on there. Because when they go to court, you want to see the two separate charges. If they ever try to argue anything, even if it's over their pet, you want to have two separate charges and two separate. And they can pay 925, but it should, at least in our system, it deducts it automatically and splits them correctly. If you get one large payment, like on Venmo or something, obviously you can go into Excel sheet and put them in there individually, but keep them separate. Um, security deposit, we already went over that. You know, it's, you're going to collect that up front. We recommend, <clears throat> excuse me, we recommend one and a half months rent. There's no rhyme or reason behind that. That's just the max we can legally allow or take uh, in the state of Michigan is one and a half months rent. Um, the higher the better because tenants are good at destroying things. Um, does that mean you have to? No. Uh, we actually had an instance where the rent was 1200 and this person was like super qualified, but didn't have the full security deposit. Like, can I pay you half the security deposit instead of one and a half months rent? I said, great. It'll be an extra hundred dollars a month in rent. Then they loved it. And the owner loved that because now that actually drastically increases the NOI by getting a hundred dollars a month for the next 24 months is more than what the security deposit would have been anyways. So he's stoked. That's a decision you have to make That's a decision I had to make. We don't always do that but it's also just a little cheat that you can use. They had the highest credit out of all their applications. So we took that risk and an extra hundred dollars a month goes a long ways. Um, charges. So we kind of went over this a little bit in the repairs and maintenance section. Uh, if they're going to get charged for a repair or not, um, if they do it's $60 an hour or it's the hundred dollar fee that is in our lease agreement that states they cover the first hundred dollars of any maintenance request it gets added in there. You need to make sure that all of these have descriptions. Rent is rent. You don't need to describe that. Same with pet fees, security deposit charges. If you put that on a lease ledger and it just says charge for $100, there's absolutely no fighting that when it goes to court. It just says charge. What is a charge? That doesn't mean anything. You could just add that whenever you want. You need charge. So repairs, maintenance, charge. Repair this charge. Or even when we take over properties, past owner balance from last the property management names, or et cetera. 
because if it shows up on a lease ledger, if you need some kind of description, that's pretty important when you charge tenants back for things. And if they agree on things, if you're nothing wrong with this, I see it often with private landlords. If it's cost them $150 a month to have their property shoveled in the winter, maybe a tenant's like, you take $25 off my rent, I will shovel everything for you. Well, obviously that makes sense if you're a private landlord, why would I spend $150? But you actually still have to create a, not a charge, but there's like a receive deposit. You still have to put on the ledger negative $25 because it's not next month's rent and then just not $25. You have to actually have a charge of negative $25. So it goes both ways. Make sure everything has a description. Um, that's the lease ledger. That's going to protect you when you go to court. Even if you don't go to court, it's literally just a track record of your tenant, which is very good to have. It's good to ha have everything you possibly can when it comes to the, the rent. Um, income statement. This is the fun part. This is the part that you probably figured out when you're underwriting, which I've quickly learned I was incorrect. My gas bill that was supposed to be $200 or something was 400. So, but it shows up very nice and big on the income statement. So your income statement is gonna show you your income, the rents, the pet fees, everything. Security deposit is not income. So we rent pet fees, any charges for that month. It's gonna show up at income up front, not like very top line. Below that, it's going to be expenses, management fees, repairs, supplies, utilities. There's actually a lot more things than that. I just ran out of room here. Then after that, at the very bottom, is be your NOI or your net operating income or net income or whatever it is you want to be gross. I guess your income could have been gross rents as well, whatever it shows up on your income statement. This is also very important. It's also it's a track record for you minus the lease ledger. That's a track record for you and your tenant. Income statement is a track record for you and your property. And it's very important to know what you're spending, what your management fee is, if you have it. If not, as a private landlord, what your repairs are, what are you actually spending? Because $50 a month on a repair could seem small until the end of the year. And you're like, how did I spend this much on repairing my property? Um, same with supplies. This is different. So you, a repair is hard to defer the two. So when you buy stuff from Home Depot, it's supplies. It's not a repair. Our repairs are labor hours. Um, I guess for a private landlord, it really wouldn't make a difference if you're doing it yourself. It would be just repairs. Um, utilities, gas, electric, water, unless the tenant's responsible. Um, mine, for example, is just I got to cover water and gas, which I'm going to build back, which actually I didn't even think about this. You could also have utilities on a lease ledger. It's going to be utility income. So if you charge back, if you charge $50 a month, if it's in the lease that you charge $50 a month for utilities, it would also be there in there as its own line item and they have to pay that as well. That's, I didn't catch that before. So that would also be in there. Um, that is literally the most basic summary I could actually give you on rent collection and accounting, because like I said, I could dig into this for an hour and a half, two, three, four. I could probably talk to you all day long about the behind the scenes of just accounting and rent collection alone. Um, so I am going to move on for this because I, I will start going into it. Are there any questions on rent collection, accounting, any concerns, any questions, just anything? For the security deposit. Mm -hmm. Um is that going into your normal business account or is that in a separate account? We use separate. We have a, for example, Propel owner operating account for all the rent. Uh, we have a Propel owner operating, a Propel security deposit account. So it is in a separate account. It can literally never be touched until they move out. You can all security it. deposits, let's say you have five rentals, can all go into that same account? Yes. Okay. You just have to make sure you can defer them all to make sure they're all, it really doesn't matter if it just make sure you know, which is which it still doesn't matter. Cause if you have the security deposits, you put them in account, that money is just there. It doesn't matter as long as you try to, that's the best way to explain this. Right. It's just sitting Legal. in an account. Can't be, yeah. can't be for anything. legally it's you're supposed minute. to have it. In a uh, yeah. Yeah. Legally. Yes. But you don't have to not legally per property actually. Okay. Yeah. But it's going to be, it shows, again, this is where the ledger comes in handy because it, you don't have to keep track of the security deposits in that account. The ledger is going to show what property, what person, tenant had that amount. So you can just throw them in a separate account. Now, Will, you piqued my curiosity. You said legally, is that per property? Because we don't do per property. We just have a huge security deposit account that cannot be touched and is separate from our rent account. Yeah, legally, that's the only thing you have to do. I don't think it has to be in separate accounts. It's just, you just need, Okay. Okay. legally, you're supposed to have like a account that you fund all the security deposits in. 
Yep. Okay. I'll just make sure. I play only. Um, I Matt, too. I just I'm eight fifty five. So I don't know how much more you got left, but I also want to leave some time for questions too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can skim through it. Then I can. I didn't realize I actually was going to be able to talk that much. So I'll just skim through. That's me at uh, in Grand Rapids at our. That's Bella Law, who we use. They're a flat rate of a hundred dollars for our cases that still get charged back to the tenants, anyways. Um, few things. So evictions. Uh, wow, I could also dig in on this. I didn't realize I actually talked that much. Um, I guess a few little things out there. If your tenants month to month, you don't have to seven day them and go through the court process if you don't want to. Um, it's a weird conversation with the tenant because you can do a non-renewal of lease or not or a 30 day notice, a 30 day non-renewal if it's month to month and they have to be out in those 30 days. They're going to be mad at you, but they're going to thank you later that they don't have an eviction on their record and you got them out of the property in 30 days. They'll thank you later. They're going to be pissed up front, whatever. Um, if they don't move out, uh, Michigan has a 10 day grace period. The court's already been notified if they didn't move out on those 30 days. And I'm going to show up with the bailiff and a 40 yard dumpster. I'm going to pick up them, put them on the curb as well as other belongings. And I tell them that, um, Sierra, man, I wish I didn't talk that much because I could, I would love to cover these topics. So if anyone has questions after, please ask about legal. Cause it's very important. Um, Michigan has uh Sierra funds. We can COVID rental assistance for tenants. If they're behind, all they need to put on their application is what, when they got distressed during COVID, what it was, you can literally put COVID on that line. And that was a form of distress and you will get your money back. It's going to take forever. It's going to take 45 to 60 days because the state's slammed right now. Um, the tenant fills out an application, the landlord fills out an application. And if you're in court and tell them that you have a zero application and you're waiting on the funds, you just added 45 days, at least in the 25th district court in Wayne County. They're going to give them 45 days to wait for those funds, and you're going to end up 60 plus days with the tenant not paying in hopes of getting CIRA funds. Um, I call the CIRA representatives and tell them they're getting evicted and I need those funds. And somehow, out of nowhere, they tell me they have a direct deposit option and not mailing checks. Go figure. Um, stay true to you. If your lease agreement says rents due on the first and you're sending out a seven day on the second, and there's a five day um, not grace period. Our rent posts five days in advance is due on the first. Seven day notice goes on in the second. That means we'll be in court by the 10th or the 11th. Stay true to that. You break that rule once. That means I tell my tenants this. If they get mad that they got a seven day, that means I have to turn around and call the other 40 people that, hey, Jim over here is pretty mad. I'm going to also pick up all your seven days and take them back. Stay true to yourself. Don't let that happen. I'm actually pretty mad at myself for not being able to cover, cover too much of this topic. But that was legal. Um, Seven days, 30 days. Uh, I wish I could dig into that. Okay, real quick. I'm going to go a little over on this because I sent these questions. I asked Will this morning out of curiosity what he thinks the top five questions would be from a conversation between an investor and a property manager. I forget about the outside perspective a lot. I talk about the things I just talked about. I never think about the questions that I would be asked. And I actually really love that I asked Will this this morning and he gave me some questions. Um, so why should I hire you and pay 5% of my rents? You don't have to, <laughs> um, you can manage it yourself. It's totally fine. But all these things we talk about, if it stresses you out at all, we'll do it. Uh, we actually don't charge a percentage. We charge a flat rate of $89 a month. And that's our management fee. That's it. We don't charge five, 10% of your rent. So if you have a nice lease, that's $5,000 a month. You're only losing $89 and not 10% of that. Uh, we can do more into that later. Um, can you handle renovations? We are actually licensed builders. We do everything in house. We're not a property management company where uh, you have a unit turn and we have to wait on a third party contractor for three weeks in for, order for him to finish up a job so that we can come and do our job. We're licensed builders. I'm going to come out. I'm going to give you the bid. When I give you the bid, you have to approve it. So now I'm waiting on you. Once you approve it, I need 50% so that we can start the work. Now I'm waiting on you. You're not waiting on me. So we kind of turned it around to where it's on you. The faster you want it, the faster you can move faster you pay us, the faster we do the work. When we're done with the work, we take full pictures of all the before and after work of the pictures, send it to you, send it to you. You have to approve it. Do you like the quality of the work? Yes or no. And then we get the other 50% of the payment, do everything in-house. We're not waiting on every, anyone. We do a lot of our turns same week. Um, how do we determine rent after turnovers? I'm a licensed agent. The other property manager is a licensed agent. We have access to the MLS. Does it make a difference? Because we actually find better rent better rental comps on Zillow. We look at what's an area based on the condition of the property. Uh, we can have two properties, bungalows, $1,500 a month. One looks like shit and the other one's pretty brand new, pretty renovated. Uh, which one do you think is going to lease out first? So I like to have that conversation because some rental owners bring me a 
not renovated property and want top dollar for it. And I have to explain to them why that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> which sometimes being honest sucks, but I don't want to be that guy saying, I'll give you $1,600 a month and it's on market for 30 days. Um, timeline for evictions could be seven to 60 days. And this actually depends on the courts right now because they're still slammed from COVID BS. Um, so right now I wish I could evict people. I like month to months because I can get them out in 30 days. Um, if they get super mad and they threaten me. I love that because I can give them a seven day hazard notice and they have to be out in seven days for threatening me. And I absolutely love that. Sometimes I hope people yell at me. Um, don't do that, by the way, that's horrible advice. Um, <laughs> average response time to tenants, one to eight hours. This covers exactly what I mentioned earlier. Uh, our online portal has a maintenance request section. The second they make a request, they say, when's the best time of day for us to come and fix this out? Can you send me pictures? I need to make a better determination of who we need to send out and what we, materials we need to send with us and who's responsible for it. I try to do that within the same business day. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to get fixed the same day if it's not an emergency, but we make sure response time the same day. And that's that. <laughs> Squeezed all in last second. I love it, dude. That was awesome. What So... Uh, Matt, Matt is a wealth of knowledge. Yes. So do you guys have any questions for him or anything that, um, you know, how much do you guys charge to do the leasing? Oh, uh, so actually we don't even charge one and a half months rent when they first move in or half months rent and $750 also flat rate throughout the board, which, you know, for your rentals that are like $900, it kind of sucks, but our average right now is 1500. So 750, of that is the norm. So it's 750, no matter what, and you handle mm -hmm. all the showings, getting them their lease, everything. Yeah, we handle every single thing. Forgive me if this was mentioned earlier, but what area do you guys cover? Um, all the Southeast Michigan, our office is in Allen Park. We are moving to Romulus. We just upgraded offices uh, within, we used to say within an hour, but we're pushing that now. We actually have a portfolio that we're going to go look at in Brighton, Pickney, and Howell area and stuff like that that we're starting to expand out to. But Very we're great. down. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We're right outside of D in between Detroit and Ann Arbor. <clears throat> and then, oh, um, just out of curiosity, since we're on that topic, it's a 5% markup on third-party services. So if it is, in fact, something we cannot fix or build or do, and we have to call a third-party contractor, uh, such as our guys can't, they don't like replacing garage doors for some reason. So we call Bob's garage door. I, forget, I think he's out of Taylor, Michigan. Um, whatever, all I do is call him. He goes and does the service or whatever, and it's just a 5% markup on that. So if it's $120 or 104 or five, whatever it is, it's just a 5% markup and that's all we charge. And that's it just for make, just for setting it up. You don't have to do anything and that's it. And that's that. And Will, can I be a complete loser and shameless plug something? Of course, man. Well, <laughs> I, would, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> all right. To get off the, it's still a little bit property management related. Also, this was peak COVID when I was chubby. Um, <laughs> Shame with fuck. So I um, started Barnett Real Estate, to buy, sell, invest, and renovate. It's a team of real estate agents. We got an office space now in Romulus in that same office. We got a little space. I started it a month ago. We got two agents. So I'm actually looking to grow that team to 30 agents by the end of the year. So if any of you guys in the Southeast Mission area are looking to get licensed and learn and just be a part of the investment world and just pick my brain or any of the other guys' brains or anyone on the team, we're totally here to help. And I would love to have you guys on the team. Um, open door real estate podcast. I feel like I shouldn't have put this on here because I'm slacking big time. I think it's been a year since I've had a guest, but I'm trying to pick it back up. Um, so any guest recommendations would be awesome. Will, I, I got to have you on it because I actually want to ask you some things, uh, podcast related. I want to have you on the podcast. Um, okay. Barnett Capital, we are a multifamily acquisition firm here in Southeast Michigan. This one's straight out of the apartment. I don't have to do anything. Um, obviously that's what allowed me to buy my four unit, which that one I bought on my own, didn't raise, didn't do a syndication, did that one on my own. Um, but I'm looking for larger 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, hundred unit deals that I will be syndicating, uh, through Barnett Capital or partnering up with any other capital or any other firms. Um, with my experience, I'm on the operation side. I'm not your guy. I'm not going to come in and raise $2 million. I could probably raise 700 or something like that. 700,000 or something. I'm not the raise guy. I'm the operations guy. I'm the behind the scenes after the deal is closed, but I'm here to make your deal work. Um, with that said, I'm like, my throat's dry. This was awesome. My contact information is below. Follow me on Instagram. We're all young, 25. We all have Instagram. If you don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. It's 2022. Follow me on Instagram at Matt LTA. <laughs> Um, but shameless plug, I threw it in there. I didn't go too bad. 904, I'll take it. Hey, you did great, man. So <laughs> I guess, anybody got any kind of 
last minute questions here. Awesome. Feel free, what, guys. Honestly, what areas are you looking? Sorry. No, go ahead, man. <clears throat> what areas are you looking? Just out of curiosity, in, in uh, Metro Detroit for future multifamily deals, or pretty much anywhere? Yes, but not the city <laughs> uh, of Detroit. Anything outside, anywhere in Michigan, we looked at a Traverse City deal, and then I plan on moving down to Nashville in the next year and a half, two years. So I've actually been looking a lot in the in those at Nashville and surrounding markets like Franklin, Brentwood, and stuff. So those are kind of my two target markets, but definitely Michigan. So, and I mean, it could be anything, even if it's like a, a 10 unit that someone's like, I, I don't know if I can take this on. I don't know. Like I'm totally game to like bring some capital and help operate it for you and show you how to do some things, but it doesn't have to be large hundred unit deals, but anywhere in Southeast Michigan, I'm, I'm game. Good to know. Love <laughs> Where are you at? I'm in Royal Oak. Oh, uh, dude. currently always looking for, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, mostly metro detroit focused but open to just about anything Dude, that market's awesome if you find a deal over there under 130 a unit we will tear it up and sell it for like 300 <laughs> it's crazy yeah. not literally but royal looks awesome if you can find the mom and pop deals actually will tupin did one out there i believe that he's done a deal everywhere <laughs> it's, it's a killer deal too bought it for like one one and selling it trying to sell it for like four or something <laughs> yeah and at the right time that's for sure <laughs> But uh, no, man, this was actually really fun. What just happened? Um, it was fun. Thanks for having me on. It was super nice. Honestly, guys, that phone number down there is my personal number. Feel free to text me, email me. The Matt Barnett sells one is my personal email. Barnett Capital ones for multifamily. But hit me up on Instagram, text me. I'm totally game for any questions, calls, whatever you want. I'm all for it. I love talking to people. And I probably could have done this for the next three hours if I wanted to. <laughs> Will gave me an hour. <laughs> no, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you.